Fault. Fault. TV. Hello, welcome to Fault TV's panel discussion, When the Party Stopped, How 2020 Changed the Bay Area Music Scene. I'm Reagan Parrish. I'm based out of San Francisco and DJ under the name Femme Electric. I'm also an occasional promoter and hosted a monthly party at Monarch called Open House before the closures. Today, I'm speaking with several representatives from the music industry to discuss how, um, how this year has impacted them personally and professionally and where they see uh, the future of our music scene um, going. Uh, today, we have Ardalan, who is a DJ and producer affiliated with Dirty Bird Records and the Artie Party. We also have Manny Alvarez from Green Gorilla Lounge, uh, co-owner of uh, Monarch and the Great Northern, and also a longtime DJ and producer. And we have Emma Marcus, uh, from a production coordinator at Another Planet Entertainment. Okay, we'll go ahead and start by having each panelist introduce a little bit more about themselves, their background in the music scene, and what they're currently doing now. And if they desire, they can share their favorite song of quarantine with us. Mine is We Ain't Going Nowhere by local producer Chrissy. Ardalan, we'll start with you. Uh, I was born in Iran. I moved to the Bay Area when I was 16 and I uh, started DJing in high school and started going to parties in San Francisco. And ultimately I moved to San Francisco and released the record on Dirty Bird and the rest is history. Thank you. Uh, Manny? Um, I'm Manny, uh, DJ M3, as you already stated. Um, what I've been doing right now is just um, getting stuff done of just getting back to me. So my favorite songs would be more like jazz and stuff. I don't have a particular favorite song, just listening to lots of jazz to calm me down. <laughs> favorite genre of quarantine then. Yeah, favorite, <laughs> favorite genre of quarantine. So yeah, I mean, just a, being a DJ producer and a promoter for the last 31 years in the Bay Area and owning two nightclubs, a restaurant, and a record label. That's all I've been doing and not been doing because most of it shut down. So. Uh, for, I forgot to give a shout out to, you're referring to the pawn shop? Oh, the pawn shop, yes. Which is also currently yeah. closed right now. Can't get a PPP for the pawn shop because the government thinks it's an actual pawn shop. They don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, it's a pawn shop. They're like, hey. Uh -oh. <laughs> so. um, and Emma? Uh, I'm Emma. I'm currently a production coordinator at the Bill Graham Civic Auditorium for Another Planet Entertainment. But um, I've jumped around through a lot of, worn a lot of different hats within this music industry since starting really in 2014 with a local promoter, Hush Concerts. Took me into a lot of different venues as well as working for Manny at times at Great Northern and at Monarch and also working for Dirty Bird. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I just... I uh, want to delve into, you gave us a little background about your hi history and the scene. Um, can you tell us, like, you know, how things were going, like, early March uh, in your career and, like, what has happened to you financially and creatively or professionally since March up to the present and any innovations you've been doing throughout that time. But, yeah, really speak to the impact of this year. Um, for me, I just uh, finished, around March, I finished my first album tour. My debut album came out last year in November and I had a really amazing, amazing tour. And literally just finished right when COVID happened, which is kind of a blessing in some ways because I finished my tour. But um, now it feels like it's just a really big break. But over the time during COVID, I've just been really focusing on making more music, obviously and um, also just doing live streams as it is. So just been doing a lot of those. I hear you've been doing some very long uh, marathon-like <laughs> live streams. Can you tell us a yeah. little bit about that? Basically just not DJing for four months. I think it just made me want to play 
all those hours that I lost <laughs> from like gigging. So um, it's honestly when I did that, I did it for Desert Heart Records, and it was a really, really gratifying experience because I was connected with the audience through the chat, through Twitch, and people were just interacting with me, and I feel like that kept me going longer and longer, and it got to a point where there was 25,000 viewers from all around wow. the world, and there was a lot of people from Iran, which is crazy, but they were all writing in Farsi, and I was reading it, and it, it was a really, it felt like I was connected to everyone in the world, and that was a very interesting feeling to have during a time when, you know, social interactions are at zero, which is uh, to be safe, obviously. So yeah, it was interesting, it was awesome. That's really beautiful. When was that initial live stream? So that was in July, I believe, end of July. I basically got asked to throw an arty party for Desert Hearts. Arty we had, party. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we had Detroit Slindle, Dante Saunderson, and Vonda Seven from Berlin. So I really wanted to have a global uh, uh, DJ, uh, for that, I wanted to have a lineup for that was like all around the world. Mm -hmm. And I was just basically supposed to play for like six hours, but they, at some point at like 7 a.m., I saw it went from like 10,000 viewers to like 23,000 viewers. And it was, I was like, whoa, this is crazy. It was kind of in a way, it made me feel like I have to keep going. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know. I'm so what stopping. were your total hours? Uh, 21 hours and 54 minutes. Wow. Were you like snacking behind the decks? I was really lucky to have my girlfriend there. She just bring me pizza, and then she went and got sushi from the, mm -hmm. from around the corner. And it was funny because she wasn't really in the shot as much, so she would just like, <laughs> I just, she, like people would just see like a plate inside of frame, the camera frame, and then every it was just funny seeing the comments. They're like, yeah, she's feeding him. She's making sure he's alive. <laughs> That's that's it was just it was just seeing people's comments and stuff. It was so funny and so awesome, and that really inspired me to uh, to just focus on just live streaming. And it's just and it's funny because I have like a sampler within my CDJ system, and I would just and I had all these soundboards in there, like Arnold soundboards, like The Room, which is a really really like bad movie from the 2000s, but it's just really funny. So I would just interact with people and just like put all these like funny. Uh, sounds and like like words and stuff and um, it was a really really cool experience just the interactions with the crowd with not the crowd with the people all around the world and um, I still don't know how I played that long without <laughs> sitting down but after I was done I basically just like every it was I feel like I couldn't have like I, I slept for like 15 hours that's for sure <laughs> Did you Is take a it? bathroom break? Um, <laughs> yeah. Did you go to the bathroom? Yeah, I played like a Ricardoville Lobos track and then went to the bathroom and then came did back. Did you have a costume change? Or yeah, I actually did. Every time, you know, the, the funny thing is people now call me the kimono cowboy. Oh, <laughs> Because um, every two hours I would change my like, outfit. At first I was just wearing like normal clothes and then like after like hour six I brought my cowboy hat and then... Um, it's funny, my girlfriend, uh, for her work, she got gifted this uh, kimono out, like robe, which looks really cool. It's like super disco, Italo, like pink and yellow. And um, I just borrowed that from her. <laughs> I was I'm like, can I get some, some Burning Man vibes? Yeah, super working. Burning Man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I wore it, and just the cowboy and the kimono, it just, it, it just changed me into a superhuman, I guess. I feel like... It, that's like my, uh, if I was a superhero, that's what I would be. <laughs> well, it's definitely the longest live stream I've heard about in uh, COVID history. So. Yeah. There was a guy that did like 48 hours on something else, but on Desert Hearts, it was definitely the biggest. And for me, it was the biggest, longest set I've ever played. And now it's like playing a three-hour set feels like five minutes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Manny, let's take it over to you. You've sort of hinted at enjoying uh, the slower pace, but can you tell us a little bit more? Because I know you also have some projects you've been pursuing. Yeah, so just as 2020 hit, we had all these plans. You know, we're going to do 20 releases on the label. We're going to do X, Y, and Z. Anthony lives in New York, who's part of Green Gorilla. We're going to do Green Gorilla in New York. We're going to do Green Gorilla in San Francisco. Maybe do one in Florida. And... Um, a little bit more about what Green Gorilla is or represents musically. Green Gorilla is a musically. record label and a party that's been around since 1996. Started in Campbell, California for on Halloween night. 
and has grown through the years to make its way up to San Francisco. I think that was probably like 99. We did, started a party in San Francisco and just have been doing it ever since. Underground, above ground, everywhere. <laughs> all the so, grounds. all the grounds. Oh, Campbell, California. Yeah, Campbell, California. There we go. So, yeah, 2020 was going to be our like, we're coming back. Both clubs are raging. We just had a great New Year's Eve party. And then it just went <whistles> to basically, okay, now you have to reimagine what that's like when everything just stops. And you're like, don't go outside, can't go anywhere. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? And I just slowly started to get back to myself instead of doing, you know, being basically working 15 hours a day, getting up, and I had to slow down to get back to me. So now that we're back to me, it's more like cooking, bicycling. Um, we've made some music, started another thing called Club Closed. That's, we've done about three or four series of that. Where we're taking live music, DJs, making a little TV show with comedians. And that's been the actually... The comedians are very funny. Yeah, I, I've tuned into one, and it, it's a very uh, lively variety program, and I <laughs> applaud you for doing something different. Yeah, it's somewhat family-friendly, a little bit. I don't know. I, don't know if you're I didn't watch it with my son, but okay, so I maybe will, not. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you know. I'll get back to you on that. Okay, yeah. The last episode was pretty much family-friendly. The next one's definitely not family-friendly. <laughs> Um, he is a fan of SNL, which is not always family friendly. So true. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I met uh, Edna Mirarea uh, from through uh, another friend, and we figured out we had all these. We we're like, how come we've never met? And she's been a great help in getting the comedians, being a really a part of it, instrumental part of it, and stuff like that, to make Club Clothes sort of like a Bay Area thing, where we, you know, having bands now and DJs and comedians come together who usually don't always mix together because we're either in like a dance club or we're in a comedy club and they really just don't mesh in live music, right? So taking all, all that and trying to put it into one or two hours has been sort of fun and daunting and more work for me, but I've taken on the challenge because, you know, I've, I've never edited a TV show before, so that was interesting. Excellent. Yeah. Is there a fundraising or financial component to the program? Yeah, so we do donation tickets, and then we have like a donation bar during the whole show. And then that gets split up between all the artists, the AV people, the comedians, and everybody doing the show. So it's not much, but it's just to give some money back to somebody who's doing something where they really wouldn't get paid. Mm -hmm. so, and every little bit helps right now because, you know, everybody's on the dole stuff like that, and a lot of people don't have jobs mm -hmm. in, in the entertainment industry, which is hurting. So it's just giving a little bit back to the community, and since Great Northern's closed, now it's a TV station, so at least something's happening there. Mm -hmm. It's just not like a barren place where we're not doing anything. Um, I want to get to you, Emma, as well, but you kind of leading me to this other question, which is I'm curious about how your um, staff and like peers have been impacted. Like obviously, you know, these club clothes aren't like employing your whole previous staff. So yeah. tell us about the bartenders and, you know, um, lighting crews and sound crew and other staff uh, at so Great Northern and Monarch. And as soon as we heard doing. we were gonna get shut down, we didn't do um, the weekend of St. Patrick's Day. Everybody got a choice to do that. So we totally shut down before that. And I think San Francisco, a lot of people did. I think that helped San Francisco into not spreading everything. Cause you know, you go out in St. Patrick's Day, everybody's like, yeah, right, woo, I'm Irish, woo. Right, <laughs> give me a kiss. Wait, you're not Irish? Okay. So <laughs> stuff like that. So instead of doing that, we shut down. We had everybody in our staff meet at Great Northern from the pawn shop, Monarch, and Great Northern, and we made sure they all got on unemployment, mm -hmm. like literally that day, that Monday. Sign up for wow. it, because we knew it was coming down the barrel. And so basically all our staff were receiving unemployment. I don't know what 98% of them are doing now, because it's been, what, are we like six months now? How long are we? Are we six months into this? I think just past seven six months? months. It was March, what? Seven. Seven, so we're seven, so. Oh. Mash you know, I don't know what most women do. <laughs> we did do a big fundraiser, which, which we gave the bar staff 
just the bar staff, um, you know, they'd get two or three hundred bucks or a hundred bucks for the donations from when Micah was doing all the live stream. He did it for like 28 days straight. And we were doing the live stream beforehand, but then he just, we're like, hey, let's just put a donation bar and see what happens and do a GoFundMe. So I don't know where people are going to be at when we come back because everybody's doing whatever they can to survive. And that's all people can do. You know, I can't guarantee everybody's jobs if they're going to have one because at the very end, we don't even know if we're going to be around. So. I hate to hear that. Yeah, you, do, you, you never know. Yeah. That's the truth. <laughs> um, well, on that somber note, um, let's turn it over to Emma <laughs> to hear about um, the impact uh, sort of in the larger events community. So Emma, tell us a little bit about your role now at Another Planet and um, if you could speak to the impact on your job, but also um, the production crews that you coordinate. That's a, I've been very, very fortunate to be employed throughout this time period. Um, we, our building has been, op it's been operating and it has been open. I have learned a lot about janitorial supplies. <laughs> Clorox wipes are very expensive. I've learned a lot about supply chains and taken on as many new roles as I can just to stay busy. I mean, I remember that week leading up to the shutdown very vividly and just everyone sitting in a conference room and just trying to figure out what was happening next. And we were supposed to have Tim and Paula at Chase Center that Friday. And that was our last show that went down. And we were getting ready, creating schedules for the runners and determining what the final, what the show was going to look like. And then it, it was canceled kind of right as things devolved. I was really looking forward to that long day, <laughs> just because I knew it might be one of the, the last ones we have for a while as things were changing. I mean, things were changing almost by the hour as that, as that shutdown started coming. I mean, it was hard to tell what was happening next. Um, and of course, another planner, planet operates a lot of different venues, and you look at all the part-time staff, whether it's security staff, janitorial staff, ambiance staff, just it gets exponentially larger the more you look at it. Stage hands, bartenders, concession staff, just. So, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but was your role before this coordinating sort of all those different crews? No, so my job within Bill Graham Civic and also for Outside Lands was a lot, a lot of permitting. So I, okay. I work with the fire department quite a bit and um, pull permits if we need street closures and make a lot of parking maps and mm -hmm. some kind of the background logistics to some of the larger shows. And of course, when we're not having shows, I'm not requesting parking to park semis. I'm not building out parking maps because we're not having shows. So in the meantime, we've done been working to advocate for Save Our Stages and all the acts that will hopefully pass through so that the entertainment industry can regain some funding and give us some more glimmer of hope for the future that we're going to come back and be able to come back and that the venues that we all know and love and have grown up in aren't going to disappear. Excellent. Um, well, let's go ahead and talk about some of those advocacy efforts you've been working on in detail. Um, I know, I don't know, maybe almost a month ago or a few weeks ago, there was the Red Alert restart and it was really lovely to see lovely in a, a, a somber way, bittersweet, but to see the community come together to light up uh, various venues in red, to, sort of to make the statement that we're all in this together and these are all the places that are part of our local culture um, that have been impacted and we're the first to close and we'll be the last to reopen. And I know that was actually a nationwide effort, um, but just seeing how many people came together in the Bay Area was really lovely. So thank you for all your work on that. Um, but if you could speak to a little more detail of uh, the Red Alert Restart program and its future goals and, and kind of any advocacy efforts you know, on the local, state, and national level that you're involved in, and if others can get involved in them. Of course. Um, Red Alert Restart happened very, very quickly. Um, 
the initial date was actually pushed back a bit, but it was on September 1st, a national campaign to bring awareness to the entertainment industry, live events industry, and create fairly, very somber, but a visual representation of what we're all missing right now, of what might close down if we don't get funding, whether it's Monarch, Great Northern, um, Rickshaw Stop, Bill Graham Civic, the Opera House, all across the country, not even small venues, some of these large space for performances and for arts are at risk of never reopening. Uh, getting, I'm so glad I was involved in that project. It was one of the most inspiring things that I've worked on in a very long time. Because it, it was so, I mean, everyone wants to get back to work. It's, there isn't, people aren't sitting here happy that there isn't anything happening. No one wants to, it's not a handout in terms of financial support either, it's just getting us through till we can get through to the other side. But Red Alert itself, just the number of vendors that contributed equipment, the number of venues that participated in a really short time period, and how many local workers, whether it's Local 16, IOTC, stagehands, or independent contractors who are just happy to pool their resources, their energy, I mean, photographers, so many people giving their unpaid time to help make this a useful event. And it was so psychologically healthy for all of us to pr participate. I mean, it's all these people who also, of course, really want to work, so it's nice because we get to work for a while. But um, that will be an ongoing campaign. I, I don't know currently what's in the works with that yet. It'll definitely be, there will be a continuation to the project, especially, or I hope there will be, given how fast it'll happen. The turnaround time didn't really allow everyone to do as much outreach as we would have liked to do. And of course, when you have so many shuttered small venues, people aren't answering the phone, people aren't checking their email every day because also it's hard to do that. When you check your email and you've gotten one email in five days, it's really disheartening. So with more times, I mean, that's that's a really tough part. I, that's, I was doing as much outreach as I could, and luckily, I mean, I can call you, I know you, and yeah. I have your phone number, but when you don't have the direct line to some of these venue owners or managers, it's really hard to get a hold of people. Um, SaveOurStages.com is a really good resource that everyone can basic, fill out basic information. It only takes a couple minutes, do it daily. It pushes the message out to congressmen, to representatives, and it's strength in numbers at this point, and it's, if I've learned anything about, um, what's the word that I'm looking for that I cannot find, but essentially when you're trying to get a hold of all these senators, and it, it's just like poking someone repeatedly, yeah. which is something I hate doing, but that's, it is something that needs to be done now, the, the best way for our voices to all be heard in terms of getting those acts through, Save Our Stages Act, Restart Act, is to, make the, everyone know that we're paying attention. It, it sounds like it's been a very successful kind of grassroots campaign. I know the restaurant industry had a similar action and strength in numbers has flown through with the entertainment and live events industry because people, people are trying and pushing through and I've not done well in the last week of making sure that I submit that form every day and I need to remember to do it. Um, do you mean the petition? Because I know I've signed a petition on... Uh, Neva or Save Our Stages. Save, Our Save Stages. Our Stages. .com is the easy one, but Neva is involved in that. There are a lot of, Neva is one of them, the National, National Independent yeah. Venues Association, but um, we've never, it's become an organizational part for the Bay Area and nationally for all to build a database to have the contact information for all the venues, small venues, art spaces, bars, places like Madrone to kind of build out that network so that we can all be in touch with each other and support each other because we need to now. And that and end goal is to secure some type of federal funding, funding. or stipend during this time or a reopening package or tax cut or something like that. Correct? Yes, to just whether it's money that goes used to, is used for rent support or paying your employees and keeping them on staff and Restart is specifically geared towards the smaller companies. So I believe it's less than 500 full-time employees. So, Okay, so for me and others out there watching that care about venues, want to go back to shows at, you know, different cultural institutions, what, where, where do we need to go? We need to 
go to save our stages save our stages dot com the petition yes and it's really it's basic times. information multiple times do it every day okay. um, you know especially for you can use the attic I will daily, whether or not it's my work or my personal email address, just make sure that my name is up there every day. Uh, WeMakeEvents.org was the company that, the group that really was behind Red Alert Restart. They have a lot of great resources as to how to get involved. And I know, I think we, I don't know if this was through a different group or just discussing all individuals affected, put a red light in your window yeah. for all restaurants, change some lighting around just so that it provides a really, intensely visual message to everyone who is paying attention. It's like Manny we... Manny's reddening the red today. Yes, I know. I am. <laughs> Save our stages. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, well, those are really helpful tips because I know a lot of us feel helpless when we can only get, <clears throat> like, you know, $50 or less to our favorite venue, but, like, we can't do that every week, and, you know, we feel like, what can we do more, so... It's social media, yeah. too, I, and for someone who is not an avid social media user, I think I jumped onto my Twitter for the first time in years to tweet at Nancy Pelosi or to tweet at some different senators or legislators, but it all helps. Yeah, really getting at the Absolutely. legislation. And, yep. You know, because I don't think we have uh, someone um, up there... And the government going, yeah, save the clubs. Because, you know, just, yeah. I don't think we have money for that to have a lobbyist it's there an, constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's, lobbying was the word I was looking for earlier. Lobbying yeah. is a lot of just poking and prodding and. Yeah, especially, especially right now in this time of politics, because it's the election's coming, everything's blown up, and every, you know, Black Lives Matter. There's so many other things that they're like, what do you guys just hold on for me? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, sure. We, we got to get past some stuff. Yeah. Um, I did want to talk a little more like on the local level. Um, San Francisco seems to be um, very cautious and responsible. And I know, you know, one of the slowest to reopen. Um, uh, do either of you, Manny or Emma, can speak to... Um, sort of the city's role or messaging to local venues and businesses about reopening? Are you getting any type of communication from I mean, them? At first, it was, I was getting communication from a friend who would get an email from the mayor's office that would go out at half an hour early, you know. But other than that, it, for the first two weeks. And then after that, it was basically whatever the news would say. That's how, that's how we're just finding out. That's, and that's a major point of frustration, of course, it's for so everyone, is that there's, we have, even though the conversations are beginning about reopening indoor dining, there's still nothing towards mm -hmm. live events. There's no information. Yeah, I think, no information. yeah today on the news, I, sort of, I was like lying in bed. I was like, wait, they said something about bars? <laughs> and they're like, when we get to bars, and I was like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I was like, okay. So, you know, restaurants are like, okay, maybe I think gyms are 10% right now. Which it seems just to me dumbfounding uh, that gyms can reopen and that we have no incoming information about even putting on outdoor events. Yeah, so it's, it's very frustrating. But at 10%, right. what I mean, can you do? The... You know, how can you make money as a gym owner at 10%? Yeah. It's not, you can't. So even at tw if restaurants are open at 25%, you still can make money. You know, you, you, minimum 80%, 90% for restaurant because the margin is like 16 to 20% if you're doing amazing right. at making. So you're saying to even open sort of, because I'm like, well, we're not going to go from uh, red light to green light. We're going to no. have the yellow light. So you're saying even in this period, it doesn't make sense financially to open like the overhead is too high for a low percentage of occupancy to make it worth trying to make money yeah. in the interim? Yeah, I'm definitely saying that. I don't see our restaurant opening up at 25%. It's okay. just because, you know, we're allowed, I think, 65 people. So at 25%, mm -hmm. you know, and then the food cost, how much do we have to up the prices because there's less people? Yeah. You know, how do people, and how, how are people going to feel about going indoor dining? Because you know, they did try it in different states, and they're like, oh, shut it back down. Mm -hmm. Spikes, yeah. You know, they did try it for like a hot second, 
We were almost going to buy a bunch of food. But we're like, let's just wait. And they literally tried it for like a week. They're like, nope. That's, that's tough. It's tough, too, is you get the green light, and then all of a sudden it's straight back to red within a matter of days yeah. where you have an expectation of what, what may be possible. And there's so, we still so know so little really about this virus and how it interacts and what it potentially does that for restaurant owners, like for you, you can't rely on getting the green light and going to buy food that could go to waste if you're not positive that you're actually going to be able to get there. Yeah. I mean, I don't, know if, I don't know if anybody really feels safe about going to an indoor restaurant right now. I wouldn't. No. Um, I, I, I feel like now. some of the outdoor dining is almost close enough to indoor dining. <laughs> Just the way it's set up and um, that you're close enough to a large enough number of people that it's almost like you're indoor dining. Because yeah. when they put up the plexiglass and then if they have a covered area over yeah. it, um, so I don't know. I I was in Hayes Valley this past weekend, and almost everyone there has outdoor dining, and they closed off the street. So it was almost like a, you know, and the weather was really nice. So it was very lively, and it felt like, wow, life is coming back. There's a few hundred people out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm just, yeah, it sounds like... Uh, in your world, like it still feels there's no information, it still feels risky, but just as a consumer being out and about over the past couple of weeks, well, maybe mostly this past week because uh, I think salons and gyms and other places mm -hmm. opened up, so it does start to, starting to feel like things are becoming relaxed. Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely are, and I feel outdoors is the way to go right now. Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, where we're at, we can't do outdoors. Sixth Emission. Yeah. For all of those who don't know what Sixth Emission is, <laughs> you're probably safe. <laughs> Once you get there, you want to get inside. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, well, on that note, I think let's talk a little bit about things we've been doing in the interim, such as live streaming. You know, Fault Radio was the only people I really knew doing live streaming pre-pandemic, and then all of a sudden everyone was live streaming. I know Monarch was one of the first venues to start regular live streaming. You've been doing marathon live streams. Um, how do you feel, or are you doing regular live streams now? And how do you feel about them moving forward? It's, uh, the live streaming has been really awesome. It's been a positive for sure. Uh, I started started a TV channel actually on Twitch with uh, some of my friends, with Justin Martin, Christian Martin, Walker and Royce, and uh, called Good TV. It's Good TV. Basically, it, it all came together when Walker and Royce they found a t TV on the side of a road that said "Good" on it, like an old VCR TV that was broken, and we just all we just basically started the whole idea off that <laughs> two weeks ago, and we made it happen, and uh, it's been growing been growing really 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 like big like fast and um, it's just a great place for all fans and audiences to get together and just see their favorite DJs and we have guests and we're doing it basically every week each artist within good TV has their own night and um, we have guest DJs as well is there a financial component to it or are you just doing mm -hmm. it for community and connection there is uh, both actually so we we have we get to, we have a, like a donation we have like set up for each DJ for like tips and stuff like a tip bar and um, there's like goal tip goals obviously and um, it's actually been really helpful we've we with the fact that we started two weeks ago it's a uh, it's 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 growing exponent exponentially and um, yeah it's it's honestly we're trying to get to the point where we can grow it even more, and I think that's what everyone's doing with Twitch. And um, yeah, it's the future. How do you feel about how the live stream viewership has changed since March? Because I feel like it was pretty strong in the beginning, and you know now it seems like it's pretty saturated. And I yeah. know some people like, yeah, are just kind of losing interest or. My mom it, has a Twitch channel. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's honestly, I mean, a lot less people were doing it in March, 
um, even live streaming or anything. Mm -hmm. Actually, I did my, like right before COVID started, the last place I ever DJ was with Fault, Fault Radio mm -hmm. uh, in top of uh, Public Works, which is really funny. And that's when the world of live streaming was introduced to me. And, um, but yeah, I think there was only a, a couple people doing it in Twitch when they first, when it, before it took off. And now a lot of people are doing it, obviously. And I can see, I can see how it's been saturated in some ways, but I think the beautiful thing about like, like a, a place like Twitch is that it's a, there's not only people that are interested in music, there's also people interested in video games. And that kind of opens up the doors to a wider audience for getting more people into like underground music. And in that way, I feel like it creates a bigger community and also helps more artists uh, in some ways, I guess, to make money off tips or even viewership. And Twitch has sort of changed too. Like they found a way to yeah, monetize from this uh, culture shift as well. Yeah, I think because it's like it's weird because you have like Facebook, like or Facebook and Instagram starting these copyright laws. Even YouTube, mm -hmm. like from experience, uh, we basically just uh, I think it was really hard for people to like play music. Like you can't play a Prince record, mm -hmm. obviously, <laughs> it'll just get muted. Uh, but on Twitch, I think they've kind of, they changed it. They invited the music community, which is really good. Because going back to like the earlier question, I feel like, you know, the music industry was just left in the corner to rot. But um, yeah, I think uh, it's growing. I mean, with the fact that we're in quarantine right now, I think a lot of people are watching it. And I personally was not a fan of live streaming, and now I really am. <laughs> You've been converted. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm definitely going to check out one of your marathon sets on a good TV. <laughs> awesome. Please do. Um, I want to ask, what are some ways... Nope, I want to back up. I wanted to ask Manny how, uh, the mo how live streaming has shifted at Monarch because you all were one of the first venues to do it, and now it seems it's tapered off, either that or I'm not seeing it in my feed as much anymore. Yeah, so um, Micah, my partner, was just starting before the pandemic, and then as soon as that hit, he was just like there every day booking someone, getting someone in there, anybody who would play. Um, I think I played one. I wasn't such a fan of the live streaming because it's just you're there alone. Um, until, I guess, until, basically until I start wanting to talk because I feel like it's better to talk while you're live streaming because then you get to know, you're like, hey, this is what I'm doing, not just like, hey, I'm here and... You know, because it's not sort of, it wasn't built, you know, it was built as a DJ set, but then I would just get bored, you know. There's nobody around. There's no, like, I'm just playing records, you know. So Monarch did do 28 days straight, and then, you know, Micah got streaming fatigue. He's like, I'm out. <laughs> so we did a few benefits. Um, you did one as well. I did. Thank you, you for did. hosting my three-year party anniversary. Yeah, we had some other ones. Um, so now it's mostly we've dialed it back to special stuff or we've taken it out of Monarch. I think Micah just did a boat party and we've taken it to uh, other places. I think he did one in Tahoe. And then if there's a benefit for something, we're definitely doing it. But to be there, to go down to a place where you usually would work all the time I think that's what so we just wanted to take it out of the club make it sort of special because I think a lot of people had got streaming fatigue mm -hmm. that's that's what I was hearing around yeah. <laughs> so. I, <did. laughs> right? um. I mean it's hard for me to watch somebody DJ unless I'm interacting when you get when you when you get start to get in the chat and that's when you're like, all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when you see your friends in the chat, and yeah. you almost, almost feel like you're hanging out again, but yeah. you can't see their dance moves, and that's what I miss. I know, but you, there's emojis. <laughs> there is. <laughs> but yeah. you guys should maybe just put a projection of the uh, of the chat. <laughs> we, the we've wall. done the zoom and the chat. That, that was cool, actually. Yeah. Then the background with the zoom, everyone zoom. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. there's. It's an up and down hill. Yeah. Now we're not so much into it. We're sort of thinking like, so now we're thinking out of the box, which now we have club closed. Mm -hmm. So it's a broadcast. It's not mm -hmm. stream live. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
it, I know it is what we have now, our broadcasts, like the one we're having right now. Yeah. And shout out to Fault Radio and all the innovative Woo! efforts they are Thank doing. You. Um, and for hosting this discussion. Um, but I also did want to ask you all, even though we don't have information and know where we stand on reopening, in your personal and professional uh, point of view, where are we right now with events? Like, what do you feel safe attending or if you were in the capacity to, to host some type of event? Or does it feel too soon? I'm, I'm still unsure of my opinion on it, actually. I'm having a hard time personally determining what I feel is right now and what, what isn't. And I also know that part of my hesitation in going to outdoor events is that one of the hardest things that I've, I've had a really hard time not hugging people that I haven't seen in a long time. And I literally just cannot put myself in the position to be around people that I haven't seen for a long time. It's just really hard for me to know that I could do that safely without feeling compelled to give people hugs. And I, I think, especially in the community in San Francisco, at least from my experience, it's a lot of people who really care about each other and are happy to see each other. And I think that that creates its own problem when it comes to hosting outside outdoor events safely. Uh, but I know, something, something, a little <laughs> shock. <laughs> Yeah, I don't feel. You put your phone I together. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I feel safe. I, you know, I mean, people are like, "Why don't you guys close down the block and do 300 tables?" And I'm like, uh, I just don't feel like it's in me to do that." Um, I've been asked to play certain other ones, which I've turned down, and at this point, I don't know. You know, right? They just. And they're like, well, it's airborne now. Well, it's always been airborne. Mm -hmm. Today, they're like, we think it's airborne. Like, you think? <laughs> so, I mean, with the CDC and with the city and with, I think, there's some people in different states, they don't give two fucks. But I think, I don't know if I can cuss. Sorry. <laughs> and, um, it's like we're in the nightclub again. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I just, yeah, I'm not feeling very comfortable. Outdoor things, I, don't know, I heard there's a, I was maybe going to go to a movie, like outdoor drive-in thing, but I don't know. I haven't felt it being really like a thing, like a big event that I'd want to do to invite people and be like, hey. Yeah. So that's why we've taken it online. You've taken it online. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, it's, right now it's like it's online or your TV mm -hmm. or. Is that where you're at as well? Online only? Yeah, I think, I mean, I agree with Emma and Manny, I, you know, it's just, I think it's better to, everything's like closed and safe because this is, you know, as, as invisible as this is, it's real, obviously, it's changed everyone's lives. And I feel like if we are on lockdown completely, we can get back to where we are quicker. And, and it's obviously like doing social distance parties and everything, like you said, you wanna hug someone. And also, you know, you're gonna drink, you're gonna have more drinks and your inhibitions are gonna just probably, you know, you're like, whatever, it's, I just, I'm just over it. I want to just, yeah. you know, be with my friends. And obviously, I, we all want to do that. There's, like, nothing, like, you know, it's, we're humans. But, you know, focusing on the positives, like live streaming and trying to interact as safe as possible will get us through this. And I think it will even make it even a bigger impact on the future. I, I think the challenges that we're seeing largely just with, how the United States has handled this pandemic nationally and also on different local levels too is that everyone's getting antsy because some things are reopening and whether or not that's the right move either, mm -hmm. it gets complicated very quickly. <laughs> yeah. it, it's definitely complex and I know it's a very, it's, it's another way that our community has been divided lately. Um, and it, it's sad to see our community broken in that way. So I just wanted to ask you all. Um, I am comfortable like doing outdoor picnics with groups and um, I'm probably going to DJ an outdoor small picnic and I feel comfortable with that. And like I said, I do feel like there's a, a, a yellow light that we're kind of in right now, mm -hmm. just testing smaller gatherings. But like you said, you have to remind people like, yo, just because we're drinking outside doesn't mean like 
we're all going to like sit in a circle and hold <laughs> well, hands and like you gotta dance. You got to bubble. You can't, you can't come to my bubble. You got to yeah. sing your bubble. <laughs> the, I, I did go to a bar, Muriel's on Haight Street, that had just kind of recently put a parklet outside. Their parklet looks so good. It is. It's, but I, have you watched drunk people take oh, their masks off? Oh, I just saw it when it was being it's installed. Just yeah, it's, but, just, it's just going to... Uh, like it's, it's and it's it's yeah. inevitable and it's I myself have chosen not to go to outdoor restaurants or go to Hayes Valley where it is so condensed. There are a mm -hmm. lot of people. It's not I don't look at those restaurants and some of the parklets and think that they're actually very distant. Mm -hmm. And again, if you're eating drinking by nature of eating and drinking, you have your mask off at times. And yeah. It's yeah. It's hard. It's honestly like I really think drunk. Drunk people cannot do masks very well, especially no. if they're not used to wearing them. <laughs> it's, it's, it's yeah. just it's just the fact that you know we have to. Everyone is just trying to survive. You know, it's it's. But this is something that needs to be. It's bigger. Obviously, the government and like yeah. people in legislation need legislation need to you know, make sure that everyone's, you know, covered so we don't have to, like, okay, we're trying to open up as soon as possible. But I do, like you said, there, ha there is going to be a yellow light. Mm -hmm. It's just, it hasn't happened yet because of all the spikes coming back, mm -hmm. all the holidays, people going out. Mm -hmm. And I think once that happens, I think even the parties are going to be even better because it's all intimate mm -hmm. and it's just, yeah. You just need a vaccine yep. and, and a fast test. Like, literally a test, you can go buy at Walgreens and 10 minutes later, you no. I, I think that the horizon would change, and my opinion would likely change, if rapid testing was available. If we had the ability to, I mean, beyond taking someone's temperature at the door, which I understand the optics of it, and the optics are important in terms of cleaning as well. People, restaurants are open, people need to know that they're being clean, and that's a very important part of making people feel safe. But taking someone's temperature at the door is not a definitive yes or no as to whether or not somebody is sick. So. I think if the availability of testing changed, then maybe this would be a different conversation for me personally. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I know we're running out of time, and we've talked a lot about the impact on us and our scene, but I also want to talk about a lot of other important issues um, that have arisen over the summer and um, how we've been activated by Black Lives Matter, the climate crisis, which is playing out on our land here and all across the West Coast um, and the upcoming election. If anyone, you know, we can go around and just speak to how we've been activated over the summer and, you know, ways that, you know, it's shifted what our, our goals and, um, you know, perspective is right now as far as priorities. Over Artie? the summer, I, uh uh, I part. I, I I got asked to. Uh, uh, I was booked for by Rave the Vote, which is a online festival that lets people register to vote and watch the watch every DJ there is. And it was probably one of the it was really really a really good experience to be. And the lineup was really awesome with Kevin Saunderson, uh, DJ Holographic. Justin Marr and everyone, and it was just such a cool uh, experience to be part of, and getting people aware about voting and Black Lives Matter, and I was really happy to be part of that and uh, promote it. Awesome, thank you for that. Yeah, this is a very important election. Everybody should vote blue. <laughs> Not just register to vote, vote blue. That's like yeah. the bottom line. We just gotta vote blue. And that's like, there's nothing like, great, go register. If you're a Republican, don't register. Don't vote. Don't want your vote. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hear, you know, we, we were a part of that. And I asked, uh, can we just say vote Democrat? They're like, no. And I'm like, that's like, you know, it's like, just register, but like, just register, but we won't tell you who to vote for. You know, the other side, they're just like, guns out. You know, as Democrats, we have to be guns out. Mm -hmm. It's a very crazy election and we have to win it's like there's it's, if we don't win it's going to just be another four years of you know the worst thing yeah ever. this election impacts so much from you know the yeah. black lives revolution and where where how the momentum that can keep going in a progressive direction and climate change obviously and even 
like the federal funding we're, we're trying to secure. And obviously, more Democrats um, would, would help push those along because we already know Republicans are trying to cut funding for unemployment and other things. Yeah, so. Absolutely. The speech that got me out of my chair, I think, was Tamika Mallory. I don't know if anybody knows her here. But um, it was a great speech. And it was just off the cuff after she had marched in or marched with Jamie Foxx. And it was on, it was broadcast on Fox. I took that whole speech and put public enemy, fight the power behind it. Nice. And literally on SoundCloud, it was like 11,000 people were like, yeah, great. And the speech just hits home on so many different levels. And that just got me like fired up. Is so, this on your SoundCloud yeah. account? Okay. Yeah. We'll have to link to that. Yeah, definitely. That's one of the things that has been both in other planet as well and also on a personal level and a lot of my coworkers have definitely been advocating for voting and making sure you know how to register and also trying to brainstorm ways to help people learn about local measures as well as national measures and try to work towards resources that are available for people to actually understand it because you look at measures on a ballot sometimes and what you read doesn't actually begin to touch the surface on what that measure may actually do. Um, and for, for the different communities who have had a hard time learning about these different measures, how do we help the public learn about what's happening on a local level as well? Um, it's been helpful for me to kind of get involved in volunteering on community levels because it also keeps my mind occupied and it helps me feel like I'm doing something useful as we're in this point where it's just we're, I feel very stuck. I mean, I think many of us have experienced the COVID waves of one day you're fine and one day everything just feels bad and it's it goes in some it's interesting just, just phases. I've, I've learned being COVID, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to think too far in the future. I'm just going to think every day is the best day. <laughs> like, I'm just going to ride my bike, make music until... <laughs> Definitely a lesson in being <laughs> present, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's been very interesting to teach myself how to slow down in this forced slowdown. It's been a challenge. I, I, I miss working and I miss doing things and seeing people and having the ability to do so. And that's... I miss, I miss work. <laughs> I miss everybody. Um, well, I know you will. You are working um, to sure work. help turn some venues into polling places, correct? Yes. Um, actually, Bill Graham Civic, also the uh, Department of Elections, will have a full tent on Grove Street out front of the building. And I know I, I need to do this today. That's what I should do is I would like to be a poll worker, too. And anyone who has the ability to do so and is willing to take that risk... Let's go do it, because a lot of poll workers in the past, I believe, have been more of the elderly population that is more at risk right now. And they should not be going out and being poll workers. There are many of us that can go do that as well. And it's a good step to take in the right direction, because I, this is I such an important up. election. Yeah. I will do that today. <laughs> I'll make sure that happens. I'm going to follow up with you. OK, please do. Um, <laughs> And it actually, I don't know if people know this, I think it's a full day affair. Like it's not in shifts, but you get a stipend up to $240. So folks looking for a little side hustle can be a poll worker for a day and um, I didn't with know some that. cash. It's, I, it is definitely a full day venture, but. It's an experience. And also many of us so are used it, to the full day It's time for the so younger, healthy <laughs> folks to, to step it up, especially if you're unemployed right now and it's something you can do. So you can find out more about that at uh, SFGov on elections. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to speak a little bit to, uh, about this. Um, having this discussion with you, I'm so grateful and grateful to Fault Radio for hosting it. Um, I've, this is a way that I've been activated. I feel like our community is really broken. We're not talking to each other, but we have a lot of the same shared experience. And so it was one thing that I wanted to do while I um, kind of lost, you know, the same passion for DJing um, to bring people together and discuss and hopefully, you know, 
spark something in those that are, that are viewing it as well. Um, I also made a concept mix um, with all black produced music and some powerful speeches, and that's on my SoundCloud. Um, and yeah, being involved as a poll worker. And um, yeah, for me, I feel like the party is literally stopped for us to take action right now in whatever ways resonate with us. Um, so yeah, thank you for being a part of this discussion. And I hope there are other ways that our typically uh, music forward community can start more important conversations. Um, before we go, I just want to see if anyone has any last thoughts to share and or if they want to uh, remind us about any upcoming gigs or efforts or things we should tune into. Artie? Um, first of all, I just want to say that I feel really grateful to be in part of the San Francisco or Bay Area music community. I feel like it's shaped who I am and brought me to doing what I love for a living. Um, very grateful for that. And um, I'm really excited for my remix album coming out in November. It was supposed to come out earlier in the summer, but we moved the back and we have so some amazing artists on there. DJ Minx is on there and uh, Kevin Knapp. Uh, I'm doing, I did a new re-edit of my remix, of my track, <laughs> of my single. Uh, it's gonna be really awesome. I'm really excited for it. And we're doing a whole remix festival on it. On Dirty Bird, yeah. Um, and it, uh, I know Bandcamp Fridays has, has been a thing. Is that a place where we can support you and Absolutely. your label? Yes, I'm going to be releasing music on Bandcamp. And I've actually been making sure to also, I buy all my music on Friday, Bandcamp Fridays. And it's, that's been... I forget, more, is that the first or the first? I think first it's the first Friday, Friday, of, every first Friday of every okay. month. And it's been really awesome. I, so. I, I love Bandcamp. There's so much good music on there. That's pretty much where I get most of my music these days. Yeah. If Anyways. folks don't know, First Friday Bandcamp gives 100% of the proceeds or from purchases to the artists. So it's a great day. Save up and buy your music, First Fridays. Yes. Manny? Um, projects coming out, Slide of Hands, which is another project I have. We have our album coming out in segments through October to November. Um, you can find this on Bandcamp, Green Girl Lounge Bandcamp. Other than that, there's clubclothes.com. You can find us on there too. All kinds. How, how often is Club Closed? Broadcast? We're trying to do it every Friday. So it's very, right now, just getting everybody on the same page and getting it all together. So we've got a few episodes taped. I think we're probably only going to do about 10 or 12 for the rest of the year and then stop and wait till next year to maybe do some more. But um, other than that, I think. I just want everybody to vote Democrat. That's it. <laughs> That's all I really got to say. Just vote Democrat. We hear Go you. register to vote. Tell everybody to vote Democrat. That's it. <laughs> Emma? Uh, it's, I mean, same. Go vote. Vote blue. Let's make sure that we can make it through the rest of this year. We'll see what the rest of 2020 brings us. Um, thank you, Fault Radio. Thank you, everyone, for thinking yeah. of me and allowing me to be here. Uh, again, all of you... I wouldn't know any of you throughout music, without music. So let's get back to it when we can safely and happily. Thank you, everyone. It's been a thank pleasure. You. Yes, thank, thank you. you. It's great to be here.